Hello, everyone. This is Jim Hughes with AFIO Now. We are a program of recorded interviews with former senior intelligence officers and those who write about them. Today, I have an amazing guest. His name is Nigel West. He is a former British uh, member of parliament. He is a prolific author about books uh, on intelligence. Uh, he speaks regularly in London and Washington and Moscow. And uh, he is so precise about uh, what he writes that many believe he is the unofficial historian of the Secret Services. Nigel, welcome to AFIO Now. Thank you. It's a delight to be with you, Jim. Nigel, you have a series of books out. We're going to be talking about one of them today, Spies Who Changed History. But before we get started, uh, how did you begin uh, writing about intelligence? What got you started with all of this? I guess I started uh, when I was still at school. I was educated in a Benedictine monastery. And one of the monks who had a particular impact on my generation of youngsters was a former MI6 SIS officer who uh, had served during the Second World War as a guards officer, had been captured in Calais, taken to a prisoner of war camp. He had escaped and he'd literally walked across Europe the whole way to Lisbon in order to be repatriated back to the United Kingdom. He joined SIS, became our station commander in Copenhagen after the war. And he had a very remarkable career. And at the end of uh, his SIS assignments, he took holy orders, joined a Benedictine monastery. And his best friend was John Le Carre, who was a contemporary of his. And Le Carre used to drive past the school on his, home, on his way home to his uh, house in Cornwall. And he'd pop in and see uh, Anthony Coombe Tennant, who was his friend, the monk. And he'd give impromptu talks to a generation of young boys, impressionable young men, who became fascinated by the subject of intelligence. And many of us, one way or another, uh, became involved in the intelligence community. And after I left school, I went to university and started working for one author as a researcher and then another author as a researcher, and both of them had been intelligence officers. So it was a, a natural progression for me to move into your world. That's a fascinating story, Nigel. What got you started on this particular book? Well, I was invited by my publishers to write a book about 10 or 12 spies who were not necessarily very well known, but who, in my judgment, had made a long-term impact on intelligence collection or the doctrine of collecting information and analyzing it and distributing it. And so I was free to choose these characters myself. And this was terrific fun. It was a real opportunity for me. And I started off in the First World War. I went after a man who codenamed White Lady, who a man called Walter Duve. And uh, Walter Duve uh, ran this organization, which is what we would now regard as movements analysis. But in those days, it was train watching. He recruited a series of women who lived in German-occupied Belgium and France, and he employed them as train watchers. And during the First World War, the majority of troop movements on the German side were facilitated by rail the railway system. And Dauvin realized that all of these trains going to the combat area or coming back for rest and recuperation, carrying tanks and armor and supplies and personnel, uh, gave an indication of what was likely to happen in the front in two or three days time. And so he recruited mainly pharmacists, women who worked in laboratories or pharmacy shops uh, close to railway junctions and these ladies had a view over the railway uh, sidings and they could count trains. And a, an average train taking troops to the front 
operating through German-occupied Belgium would be reported on 12 or 14 times by different women along the route. And this information was then smuggled into neutral Holland and passed to GHQ. And the British intelligence analysts had this information within 48 hours. So in the First World War, this was dramatic. And it invented the concept of train watching. So I felt that Walter Dove was a remarkable man that very little had been written about. And I was able to find one of his manuals, one of the documents that he used to give to his agents to recognize a particular kind of rolling stock and whether this railway equipment was carrying tanks or ammunition or cavalry or whatever it might be. So that was terrific fun. Nigel, that's a wonderful story. Do you have any other examples of some of the um, persons that you selected for the book? Yes, I, I think there are two others that are of significance that I think will attract readers. And I was going not just for members of the intelligence community, but a wider audience. Uh, one was a man quite well known as the recruiter of the Cambridge Five. So his name was Arnold Deutsch. Now he had been, uh, he was a, an Austrian of Czech origin, uh, operating as the NKVD illegal resident in London. And he recruited Kim Philby. And in his file, very remarkably, I found documents that turned out to be the confession that had been written by Kim Philby when he accepted an immunity from prosecution in 1963. So here was a fairly well-known spy, Arnold Deutsch, who recruited a man who became even more famous than him, Kim Philby. And the added value to the version of events that I describe is that this is the first time that Kim Philby's confession, which he was obliged to write in response to, in his acceptance of his immunity from prosecution, this was the information that had never been seen before publicly. And it was in... Arnold Deutsch's file, but unexpectedly, it wasn't signed by Philby. Philby's name doesn't appear anywhere on it. It just says memorandum. But as soon as you start to read it, and when I recognized the date, the 16th of January, 1963, I knew exactly what it was. The other case that I found fascinating, which was it is the most modern case, is an example of defenestration. So, People who have studied this Middle East and have been involved in Yom Kippur and have a memory that stretches back to the 1956 Suez Crisis will know that Colonel Nasser's youngest daughter married a man called Ashraf Marwan. And Ashraf Marwan, oh, it now turns out, was a Mossad asset. He was a walk-in. He volunteered to the Mossad station in London in 1973, and he was responsible for passing information about the Egyptian plans to attack Israel over the Yom Kippur holiday. And so Ashraf Marwan was a very remarkable man, and the added value that I bring to the accounts that have been published about his experiences as a spy codenamed Angel was, first of all, that I've been in touch with the Mossad case officer who ran uh, Ashraf Marwan. And secondly, the story ends in tragedy because a few years ago, his name was disclosed inadvertently in litigation in Israel between two senior intelligence officers. And by mistake, Marwan's name was disclosed in a court judgment but it was prematurely released onto the internet. And six weeks after that disclosure, uh, Ashraf Marwan fell from a sixth floor balcony in London at his home and was killed. And so I described the police investigation into that defenestration. And the evidence that I've produced strongly suggests that this was murder and that there were two Libyans who were directly involved in throwing Ashraf Marwan out of his uh, window in his apartment in London. 
So I, I hope that there is new information in, in each of the chapters of the book, and that will uh, attract a wider readership than I usually get. Nigel, those are great stories. Uh, when doing the research, what kind of declassified records were you able to access to get into all this material? Well, we live in a golden age of disclosure and declassification. And I relied really on, on two sources of information. Firstly, MI5 files that have been declassified. SIS files will never be declassified in the United Kingdom. They are um, covered by various legislation to protect sources and methods and understandably agents. And so SIS material will never be be released. But MI5, following uh, the intervention of two successive directors general who were educated at Cambridge and are historians, they authorized the release of about six and a half thousand historical MI5 files to, to queue to the, the public record office there. And what makes these disclosures so extraordinary is that there was a big argument within the British intelligence community about whether or not we should follow the American path of declassification or whether it, it's better to be able just to retain everything. And the world didn't come to an end when these MI5 files were disclosed. So there have now been five separate releases from MI5. Some of the material, of course, has been redacted, but most of it is in its original form. And in intelligence terms, this is the holy grail. This is fantastic. And the other very important source is the Crest system that the CIA uh, has cooperated with the internet and declassified and placed on the internet a huge amount of material, I think about 7 million pages, as a consequence of Bill Clinton's legislation dealing with wartime uh, alleged war crimes against German individuals. And the agency has has dumped this material onto the internet, and it's a treasure trove. There are another 150 books to be written uh, based on this material. It is really quite extraordinary. So this book that I've written is exploiting the liberalization of the rules relating to the disclosure of documents. And as I mentioned to you off camera, CIA has now begun declassifying batches of the president's daily brief. And I'm very happy to say that AFIO has been a joint sponsor of the public events when CIA has done that. And we hope to continue that in the future. Nigel, this interview would not be complete without you telling our audiences about finding Garbo in Venezuela in 1984. Well, I'm sure that your audience is very familiar with the, the case itself. He was a double agent. He was a Spaniard. Uh, he was a fabricator. He was brought to England by the Secret Intelligence Service after he had been identified as a fabricator in Portugal. And he became one of three wireless agents operating in the United Kingdom prior to the D-Day landings. And he became the principal purveyor of deception material to the enemy. And in 1972, details of his exploits were released by Sir John Masterman. And uh, it, it caught the public imagination because, first of all, his code name was rather exotic, Garbo. His case officer thought he was the best actor in the world. That's why he was called Garbo. And then the other extraordinary thing about him was that he had a, an organization codenamed Arabelle, known to the Germans, uh, as their best network in the United Kingdom, 25 separate agents, uh, a young student, Venezuelan student in Glasgow University, an Indian nationalist in Dover, 25 of these people, all of them had money troubles, girlfriend issues, wife problems, none of them existed. They only existed in Garbo's head. And I set out in 1972 to try and find Garbo. I was told that the the reference book said that he had died in Angola uh, long after the war. But I felt that as a master deceiver, he might still be alive. And I spent 12 years trying to track him down. I eventually found his true name, 
His name was Juan Pujol Garcia. And at that time, the prime minister of Catalonia was called Pujol. So I knew that the Pujol name was quite a, a well-known but common name in Catalonia. And I employed a researcher to go through the Barcelona telephone directory, the best intelligence resource in the world, really. And he found 326 J. Pujol Garcia's. And I'd created a profile of a, a man who was now of a certain age, spoke good English, had been in the war in London, and presumably would be quite mysterious about exactly what he'd been doing. And eventually I tracked down Garbo's nephew, who revealed to me that uh, his uncle had sent him a postcard about six or seven years earlier from Venezuela. And I employed a researcher in Caracas to try and find this mysterious man and eventually identified him. And the challenge for me then was to persuade this man who had retained his identity and uh, had not made any disclosures about what he'd been doing during the war, how to persuade him to go public. And you mustn't tell anybody this, but I rang up the Duke of Edinburgh, who is a great spy buff, and said, little white lie. I said that Garbo was alive and was going to come to London for the 40th anniversary of the D-Day landings in 1984. And the Duke said, well, everybody knows that Garbo's dead. And I said, no, 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 he's alive. And he's coming to London. And he said, well, if he comes to London, then we will have an investiture for him because he was awarded a medal in 1944 for his contribution to the success of the D-Day landings. And we will make certain that he is properly honored and he receives his medal with the, the public statement that couldn't be given in 1944. So my first call to Garbo in Caracas was to say that I was calling from Buckingham Palace, which was again, another little teeny weeny white lie, you mustn't tell anybody. And it, he, nobody refuses a call from Buckingham Palace. And in those circumstances, Garbo agreed to come to London. And I first had to meet his family in New Orleans. His son was a student at medical school at Tulane University. And I had to explain to his children first what he had done because he told me that they would never believe him. He had never told them anything about his wartime experience. And so he came to London, he went to Buckingham Palace, he received his medal. And then on the 40th anniversary itself, he walked along the beaches of Normandy, the invasion beaches. And Monsieur Pompidou was there, the French president, President Reagan, Mrs. Thatcher was there. It was really a very remarkable uh, event, the, the last of its kind. And Garbo himself died in 1989, but he was a very modest man. And I'll never forget when we walked through one of the cemeteries, American graveyards in Normandy. He came to the entrance after having walked alone for about 15 minutes and tears were rolling down his cheeks. And he, I said, I don't understand one. This is a day of celebration. You've been recognized by many people because of the publicity that you've received over the past few days. This is a day of celebration. You should be happy. And he said, the problem with your generation is that you don't understand. I was told that I'd saved tens of thousands of American lives during the D-Day landings through the deception campaign. But he said, looking at the graves of all these young men, I really didn't do enough. So he was a modest individual. Uh, he explained that he'd fought in the Spanish Civil War on both sides and was absolutely determined to undermine the Nazis, who he thought would destroy European civilization. And the, at the conclusion of that, he went to the British Embassy in Madrid to volunteer his services. And British diplomats threw him out and said, we're not interested, you're a neutral, you're a non-competent, you're a Spanish, keep out of the war. And Juan then went straight round to the German embassy and said, I'm a great admirer of Herr Hitler, I'd like to be a spy. And they recruited him, and he only managed to get as far as Portugal, 
fabricating information. He couldn't get to England. And that was eventually when he was discovered by wireless intercepts of his communications. So, and he was then recognized as a fabricator and brought to England. The, arguably one of the great double agent stories of the Second World War. What a great story. And congratulations on your detective work. Well, the name of the book is Spies Who Change History. It's a fascinating read. And I want to sincerely thank both Nigel West and Frontline Books for a really a very interesting interview. Thank you.